Welcome back to Weatherbox. If you're new here, my name's Steve. I make cool videos about the weather every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. And today we're gonna to talk about tornadoes. The average lead time for a tornado is about 10 minutes, which means you have 10 minutes from when the warning is issued to when the tornado hits your neighborhood. And if you're vigilant, that's usually enough time for you to grab your to-go bag, which you probably still have to make and head to the basement. Cool. What if there's no tornado warning though? What if for some reason the National Weather Service doesn't detect a tornado until after it's already reached F5 intensity and destroyed an entire neighborhood killing 29 people? Unfortunately, that happened on August 28th, 1990. A very violent tornado touched down at 3.15 p.m. near Oswego, Illinois and rampaged through a Wheatland Township subdivision, demolished a high school in Plainfield, and lifted as it entered Joliet. Because there was no warning, no known photos of this tornado existed. The only video we have is of the parent supercell about a half an hour before the tornado dropped. In order to understand how something like this happens, we have to understand how the National Weather Service issues tornado warnings. In modern times, we have Doppler radar, which sends out a beam of radiation into the atmosphere at different angles. The beam then reflects off solid objects in the atmosphere like rain or hail and bounces back to the radar site. The intensity of the received reflected beam corresponds to the color on the screen. Red and pink usually mean heavy rain and hail, and green means lighter rain. Tornadoes aren't really rain though, they're just columns of wind, so how can we get wind data from a radar beam? This is the genius of the Doppler effect. Have you ever been sitting in traffic and then you hear an ambulance siren coming up behind you, and you notice that the moment it passes you, that siren changes in pitch? That's because when an object emitting sound is moving towards you, that sound appears as a higher frequency than when it's moving away from you. By using the difference in frequency of what you hear when the ambulance is moving towards you versus when it's stationary, you can figure out how fast the ambulance itself is moving. The same applies to raindrops. The reflected radar beam is at a higher frequency if the rain is moving towards the radar and at a lower frequency if the rain is moving away from the radar. This is how we can create a map of the wind field of a storm. The areas in a storm where red and green are close together shows rotating winds, and when the colors are bright and intertwined, they form a couplet, and we know that this is a tornado. This radar technology was implemented in 1992 two years after the Plainfield disaster. If you watched my video on the super outbreak of 74, you know that the radars of the time could see the size and the shape of the storm, but they could not detect the wind field. Furthermore, it was reported that the technician observing the Plainfield tornado didn't know how to tilt the radar upwards. The result was ground clutter or the reflection of the radar beam off the ground, making it impossible to see the shape of the Plainfield storm. This is why storm spotters are so important. No radar technology will ever replace eyes on the ground. There's one more innovation in radar technology that makes detecting tornadoes so much easier. Dual polarization. Big word, simple concept. Instead of sending out a single horizontally polarized beam, also send out a vertically polarized beam. Based on the intensity of the reflected beams, we can now determine the three-dimensional size, shape, and variety of objects in the air. What else is in the air besides water? Birds? Maybe. Debris lofted by a tornado? Absolutely. This product is called the correlation coefficient, and when it drops below 0.7, the object in question is not water. So we have all these amazing radar tools. We have thousands of storm spotters across the country. Does the National Weather Service with our modern technology ever just completely miss a tornado? Yes, way more often than you'd think. There is a big distinction between violent tornadoes and weak tornadoes when it comes to detection. The violent ones are much easier to detect and they're the ones that cause the most fatalities. These tornadoes form in supercell thunderstorms which are typically individual in nature, have a classic recognizable shape, and have a pretty predictable storm structure. But there's another type of storm that can cause very erratic, damaging, short-lived tornadoes often after 12 a.m. when everyone is asleep. These are quasi-linear convective system tornadoes, or QLCS. Another scary word, it just means a line of storms that has very strong winds and moves very fast, usually in front of a cold front. If you live in the United States, you've probably experienced getting hit by one of these things at least once in your life. A tornado can pretty much form anywhere along this line of storms at any time. The good news is that recent research has given meteorologists a better idea of where a QLCS tornado is most likely to form. Take a look at some of these tornado confidence builders. Some helpful indicators include areas where there are breaks in the line of storms. The southern tip may be the source of the spin-up tornado. Inflow notches. These are areas where air is rushing into the storm and can intensify rotation. 
You can sometimes even see hook echoes on the Boeing line itself, and there are many others. There are also big research projects like Perils, which is trying to understand why QLCS tornadoes form in the Deep South, and Reed Timmer has even put his own probes in front of some QLCS tornadoes. I highly recommend you watching his video. But many of these tornadic changes in a QLCS line happen in a matter of minutes, and radar can only complete a full scan every five minutes, so many of these changes go unnoticed by meteorologists. Five minutes is enough time for a QLCS tornado to form, damage a subdivision, and lift before the National Weather Service can even issue a tornado warning. In fact, this happened in Tulsa on August 6th, 2017. This unimpressive squall line produced an EF2 tornado that hit downtown Tulsa, Oklahoma after 1 a.m. with virtually no velocity couplet and no reflectivity signature until well after the tornado passed through the city. This is just one of many instances of these QLCS tornadoes going unwarned. But another reason the reason why tornadoes may go unwarned is because they're located in radar gaps. The United States and its territories have 155 WSR-88D radar stations. Each radar station has a maximum base reflectivity range of about 143 miles. But due to the curve of the Earth, a radar beam that is 100 feet above the ground at the radar site is actually 10,000 feet above the ground 100 miles away. Not only that, but the beam gets wider the farther away it is from the site, resulting in a lower resolution for that area. There are many rural areas in the United States that have significant radar gaps that actually experience tornadoes quite often, but Charlotte, North Carolina might be the biggest U.S. city that has a significant radar gap. The closest radar is located 80 miles away in Greer, South Carolina, so the radar beam that's over Charlotte is about 8,000 feet high. QLCS tornadoes happen a lot lower than that, which is certainly a factor in the unwarned EF2 that hit Harrisburg, a northeastern suburb of Charlotte, at 2.30 in the morning on March 3rd, 2012. The velocity product showed little discernible rotation at the time, and the reflectivity product showed nothing spectacular in the shape of the storm. This has happened many times and will continue to happen until we get more radar sites built to fill the gaps. The thing is, according to the National Weather Service, this might not be a big issue to begin with. When Congress asked the National Weather Service in 2017 about radar gaps, they conducted a study on severe weather events where the radar beam was 6,000 feet and higher above the ground. Quoting the article by the Washington Post, the radar gap study found no significant negative impact to warning performance that could be tied directly to radar coverage where the beam is higher than 6,000 feet above ground level. They did acknowledge that several EF0 to EF2 tornadoes tornadoes were missed due to the coverage, but it didn't make up a significant portion of the data. Personally, I agree with the criticism of this study. I think it's important to see below 6,000 feet everywhere in the atmosphere. An EF1 tornado is enough to destroy a home and ruin a life, and if we don't have that technology to issue a warning to a city of a million people, that should absolutely change. I think I saw a couple proposals to build new radar sites. One of them was in southeastern Oklahoma. If I can find that article, I will link it in the description below. And let me know if you guys have ever experienced an unwarned tornado. I myself haven't, but that sounds terrifying. Thank you guys for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe to push my videos out to a wider audience. It is already working, and thank you so much. And I will see you guys next Wednesday.